Welcome back AB Calc students, Mr. Record here, and we are going to take a look at our second example for topic 7-8. We're finally getting into some real world examples, and we're going to be talking about something that could really make you sick. Radioactive isotopes. A lot of history about various accidents that have occurred around the world with nuclear power plants that have been very, very misfortunate. But there's a way to study exactly when it would be safe to go back into a region that has been contaminated with radioactive elements. So let's take a look at our half-life problem. First of all, you might recall this topic if you um, took, a, a say, a chemistry class or maybe some other kind of math course that dived into this application of exponential growth or exponential decay. But we're going to take a little bit of a different approach with these problems because we now have this formal growth and decay model that we are uh, starting to work with, and that is our good friend KECT. So we're going to work on the assumption, as with fairly all radioactive problems that the rate of decay is proportional to the amount of the material. In other words, you tend to decay uh, and, and eat away at a lot of that material the more of it that is already there. And so that is going to be our guiding principle throughout uh, this example and other ones like that. Now I've listed six very common radioactive isotopes. You do not have to memorize these. That is not the point of this class. So anytime that we throw one of these isotopes at you or one that is not on this table, we will provide the half-life. But in a nutshell, you've got uranium-236, which uh, is a pretty volatile substance. It's going to take four and a half billion, with a B, years for an amount of uranium to decay to half of its original amount. It's probably one of the most volatile and destructive elements that we uh, have on the planet. Carbon. Uh, is is a very interesting one in that it has a half-life of 5,730 years, which is absolutely perfect for dating a lot of things on this planet because almost every living thing on this planet is made of carbon. And so if a dinosaur bone is dug up, we use carbon dating to determine exactly about the time that dinosaur or other animal may have been uh, uh, walking around. Carbon dating is also used for things that haven't been dead for nearly so long, like homicide detectives will use it to determine how long a body may have been uh, uh, laying in a alleyway or something. Uh, we got our plutonium, another very uh, volatile chemical or uh, substance that will take 24,000 years to to decay. We've got our Einsteinium, our cesium, and then <laughs> Nobelium. I got to laugh at that one. 23 seconds is all it takes for half of that to disintegrate. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at um, a modified version of a real world uh, example here. Some of you are a little bit familiar with the Chernobyl nuclear accident. In fact, there has been a, a wonderful series that has been produced uh, not so long ago on HBO that details this information. I have a lot of, uh, uh, or not a lot, but I do have one friend that I know that uh, was able to uh, visit the Chernobyl area, and it's very much like a ghost town, he says, in that you're not allowed to go in certain areas. You can visit under strict supervision, uh, but he mentioned something along the lines of seeing an apartment complex that pretty much has remained untouched for the last several three and a half decades or more, uh, in that the breakfast dishes are still out, the toys are still scattered about the, 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 the living room floor as these families families had to take up and leave right away. Suppose that 15 grams of the cesium isotope CS137 uh, that was released during the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear accident uh, was absorbed into the groundwater. We want to know how long will it take for that 15 grams to decay to one gram and thus let's say that one gram of this would be safe to drink spread out through so many um, you know, cubic uh, feet of, of water. Now I want you to realize that 
this is a bit simplified. You don't measure radioactivity in the amount of grams. It's typical uh, measured in like a parts per million, but we're simplifying this so that we can work our mathematics a little bit. So the very first thing that you want to realize is that we said that all radioactive decay problems operate under the principle of direct growth or decay, which means we can use KECT. The only thing I'm going to do a little differently with my KECT, if it's all right with you, is instead of using the variable Y, I'm going to use the variable A for the amount. And I'll dress it up in his Sunday best as it's the amount at time T. And so from here, you should be able to extract some information from the problem that will enable you to find the value of C. Right? So we see that uh, there was 15 grams released at the outset of this nuclear accident. So basically, when T is 0, we know that C is 15. Now, if you don't realize that that means that C, uh, let, let me let me rephrase this, you guys. I didn't want to get ahead of myself. When T is 0, we really need to say that A of T or A is 15. So when we solve this, 15 is going to be equal to C E to the 0 times K. Now what's going to happen is, yes, C is going to be 15. And maybe some of you saw that coming from a mile away, or maybe when my wife was shutting the curtains, you got distracted there. I don't know. I almost did. But C is going to be 15. Basically, whenever they give you the initial amount, that is indeed what C will stand for. And so it is perfectly okay for you to bypass this work in purple if you're confident and you can just jump right here to this statement. Now, we cannot go any farther with this. In other words, we can't address this question. How long will it take for the 15 grams to become one gram? Basically, that one gram is this A. We can't solve this equation for T unless we know our K. So there has to be another relationship in the problem. And if you read through this, it seems like you're out of numbers. And I know that can be kind of frustrating. But it turns out that we're not out of numbers. This is a half-life problem. So what that means is, if we go to the half-life, which is 30 years. So when T is equal to 30, we know that the amount is half of what it was at the beginning. And if it was at 15 at the beginning, you would have to physically take half of that number, which is 7.5. And now you can plug these two values into that equation, and you should be able to find your k. So we would have 7.5 equaling 15 e to the kt. Well, no matter what you put in these two spots, you're going to notice that, oops, and I'm sorry, my t should be 30, otherwise that defeats the purpose. But no matter what, the division of these two values are always going to give you a 1 half. And so there are a lot of students that always solve for their k by just simply setting one half equal to e to the half life times the k. And that's perfectly acceptable as well. Regardless, you are going to have to take the natural log of both sides to pull this off. When you take the natural log of the, left, of the right side, I'm going to probably in the next example or two sort of wean you off from writing this step because it's probably not going to be so necessary. But we end up bringing the 30K out in front only to see that the ln of E will disappear indeed. And K is going to equal 1 30th times the natural log of 1 half. Now, it's really important that you resist the temptation to convert that k to a decimal. And the reason is because, especially in a problem like this, where you have a fairly large amount of time that your half-life is measured in, you could 
potentially give an answer that's not as accurate as it should be. And let's face it, we don't want to drink this water unless we know it's absolutely safe. And so let's go ahead and just leave this K as accurate as possible. We'll talk about when the time comes when you would use a calculator down the road for certain problems. So here we have it. We've got A of T officially equal to 15 times E to, here's our K, 1 30th ln of 1 half, all times t. And all of that will be our exponent of e. So at this point, we look deeper into the problem, and we see that we're supposed to figure out at what time are we allowed to drink the water. Well, we could simplify this expression now, or we could do it later. It really doesn't make any difference. In other words, we could plug in our 1 for uh, a of t and then start to simplify. Uh, in fact, I will go ahead and say let's do that. When a of t is 1 gram, what we're going to do here is we are going to use the 1 over 30 to be the power of the 1 half. And notice how this t is kind of involved with that 1 over 30. In fact, in fact, and there's no need to change your paper here, but I could multiply that t by the 1 over 30 just to prove that all of this is being multiplied by the natural log, which in turn means that that t over 30 can be the power of the 1 half. Now, what's that going to do? Well, oops, and I find, I find a, that I forgot to put my E there. That's important. Now, what that's going to do is the E and the LN will indeed now cancel. And I have 15 times really what's left here, which is 1 half all raised to the T over 30 power, which is something that we can now solve. Our next step would be to divide by 15. And pretty much the reason why the study of logarithms are so important to mathematics is because it is the primary tool by which we can solve equations that have variables in the exponents. That's, that's what we use them for. You use them all throughout uh, the sciences. So we're going to take the natural log of both sides. And as you recall, with natural logs, this exponent can then find its way out in front of the natural log. And then to get t all alone, we're going to divide both sides uh, by, or ac actually, I tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do to make this a little bit easier. Let me back up. There's a lot of different ways to do this, but I, I, I want to pick something that you're going to be most comfortable with. Whenever you get to this step, you've taken um, the natural log of both sides. And, and forgive me, because I'm, I'm going to end up potentially writing what I just wrote. So we're going to go ahead and make sure that this exponent has to leave that position. Okay, hopefully you didn't erase anything because it is the same, and I apologize. I want that exponent to make sure that it vacates that position because that is the only way that you can start to truly solve for this using the algebra that you know from, say, the beginning of your algebra journeys. Now, here's the part that's a little bit not so fun. You are going to divide both sides by the natural log of a half. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, that right side, or left side, I should say, is starting to get a little busy. And at this point, at this point, this problem here is certainly going to be perfectly suited to using a calculator. Now, I can show you what the answer would be without a calculator. All it would be is a matter of multiplying 30 over to the other side, and then you've got a very ugly fraction, ln of 1 15th 
divided by ln of one half. And I and I understand. Yes, this could be rewritten as natural log of one fifteenth minus. Um, in fact, I, you know what? I don't even want to go there. The whole idea of splitting two logarithms, I, that, that is actually not even the, the, the direction I want to go anyway. I want to use the calculator, basically is what I'm saying to you. But I'm going to um, bypass the physical manipulation of the buttons of the calculator because um, that's something that I'm sure that you can handle with whatever model that you're using. My advice would be just to type this in first divide by all of that, you're going to get that decimal and then say multiply it by 30. But if you have a multi-line calculator, if you're using a really sophisticated graphing calculator like the TI Inspire, even the TI-84, you should be able to do this and get um, about 3.90, um, uh, uh, let's see, yeah, about 3.9 prior to multiplying it by the 30 in about 117.207 overall. So that should be your answer. And it would be measured in years. And what that basically is saying is that um, we are not going to be ready to be drinking this water in Chernobyl you know, anytime uh, in, the, in the near future. This is 117 years after the accident happened in 1986. So this gives you a very good look at what a traditional radioactivity problem would look like. Many of our other models are going to stray a little bit from this, but by and large, it's the same philosophy. So you want to tune into these problems and see how they uh, start to fluctuate just a little bit. If you like what you see, hit the subscribe button. Make sure you tune in for our future videos, and we will see you next time.